Hi, Vincent. Thank you very much. Hi, Sid. Hi. Thank you very much for agreeing to have a chat with me. It's really lovely to celebrate your exhibition. Fantastic. Um, it's a shame, of course, that we can't do this in person, but we do now have news that your show can be open and we can hopefully welcome people from the 12th of April. So um, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, this is the second solo show you've had with me in the gallery here in South Bermondsey. Um, the exhibition title is Like Landing a Comet. It's one of the questions I'm keen to ask you is about the exhibition title. Um, but as a way of context, before we dive in, I think it's important to say that you were part of my first ever exhibition as a gallery mm -hmm. in 2016. Um, so we've had a pleasure of working together for many years now. Absolutely. Was it um, 2016? Sorry. Yeah, June of mm. 2016. So ne nearly five years ago. I know, crazy, isn't it? And I think one of the reasons it's gonna be so nice to have a conversation with you is so much has happened to the work in that time. And this exhibition feels like a real celebration of a bit of a deviation perhaps of new themes and ideas that you've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, to kick us off, I'm going to try and share my screen. So I thought a nice starting point was in the studio where you spend a huge amount of your waking life. Um, this is a studio shot from a few years ago now, um, but perhaps we can dive in here and you can tell us about what your studio life normally looks like and where you're based and what your routines in the studio are. Okay, yeah. Well, my studio is in Hackney at Deborah House and it's part of the space set up over there. And the space was set up, as most people know, by um, Pete Townsend of The Who and Bridget Riley and a couple of other people as well back in the late 1960s. So I've been there for about 25 years and um, my days normally a sort of a drive from South London through the Black Hole Tunnel to the studio. And I spend usually about four hours there each day just making work before I can then drive back home again because I'm only allocated four hours to be able to park there. Yes, usually I get to the studio, kettle goes on and um, make a cup of coffee, look around, see what's going on in the studio and take it from there, really. That's lovely. Um, I, as you say, what I've started here is just to flip through old shots, new shots, everything. So we can, um, perhaps it's quite a lot to digest at the very beginning. Um, mm. But I suppose the fairly recent progression and the last solo exhibition you had with me, which was in late 2019, um, was to celebrate this night garden series. And I suppose one of the points I wanted to ask you about is life since lockdown has come out of the studio in quite an interesting way. You've been making yes. work at home, you've been making some work in the garden. Yeah. Do you want I mean, to elaborate how that's happened? I do, yeah, absolutely I do. I mean, what was quite fascinating in the last year has been that, that We've been plunged into this situation where we don't know from one day to the next how things are going to turn out and um, like right from the the word go um, I was sort of aware of the absurdity of this situation and how we were living in some kind of almost like science fiction scenario it seemed and um, I just wanted to kind of try and make sense out of it, out of it if I could. Uh, I've been making these drawings in my little sketchbook, these little ink drawings that um, basically started from the series from 2019, the Night Garden series. So with the Night Garden pieces, um, these, the work that I was doing last March was a sort of carry on from, from there and I'd taken up mainly by uh, making these little ink drawings in moleskin books that were based on being in the garden with this absurd sort of outlook of, of what am I going to find each day when I pull back the curtain on the kitchen door and see what's outside and so what was happening was I, I was getting these kind of instant flashes of what could I see today and 
you'd have things like performing seals or giraffes, a rhino, an elephant, shark, UFOs. What am I going to find today? And it was a sort of a metaphor for the sort of absurdity of what's going on at the moment with the, with the virus, and COVID. So it all sort of started from there, actually. And then when the weather got better and I could go outside and start making work in the garden, I was making pretty much similar stuff that I'd made in the studio, i.e. Uh, works on paper, folded paper made with watercolour and because I sort of didn't have much watercolours at the time, I started making my own dyes just out of things like onion skin dye, which actually has a mordant in it that is a fixative. It's used in textiles and, and it's a really good way of fixing a colour. So it was turmeric and, and red onion skin dye that I was making and making these folded pieces. And pretty soon our living room wall was covered in them. So it was like walking into a little gallery space above the seats and above the <laughs> fireplace. And um, it was uh, quite fun to do, really, I must say. The weather improved and I spent more and more time out there. Yeah, it definitely informed your palette, too. You could tell it was a hot summer by what you were making. Some yes. Oh, well. yes. And one well, of the things for me mm -hmm. that was particularly interesting about your moleskin drawings is that it's the one of the examples of you letting yourself be completely figurative and representational. Um, yes. It was brilliant to see the creatures prowling the gates and all sorts of imaginative <laughs> things. Um, at, but interestingly, lots of stages and lots of sort of characters and a very performative idea evolving as well. And, and the thing is about them too is there's there's something of a like a weird nocturnal sense about it too, as though it's it is being undertaken during the night time, yeah. or there's some sort of twilight world, which pretty much is what I was thinking about on um, that we found ourselves in with the with the virus and COVID, but also there's another side of it too, which involves Brexit, and I've I've sort of since devised this term. Covid Brexititis, which we seem to be suffering from here in the UK, and um, that's become part of it too. This whole um, idea of being trapped, yeah, on, on, in this country on an island. With one, we have a basically a plague, and the other, we have a a, a sort of um, a loss of opportunity for a freedom of movement. Sure. And so, this one particularly, sorry, just while you're talking, Vincent, I'll take us to look at this particularly, because this is a very mm -hmm. good example of your sort of floating, lonely island, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. Starting to evolve. It's funny with that piece because I wasn't going to, I was going to go much further with it, but I, I put it up on Instagram one day. It was seen spotted in another photograph, and people said, "What's going on with that?" And uh, I, I started to relook at it and thought, oh, that's actually very interesting, isn't it? The way that sort of sits there. It's like a, a smashed up egg in an egg cup with yeah. a green tree growing out of it. And they're like little figures and um, going on in there too. So it is like an island, like rock hall or something like that. And, and a lot of these, sorry. sorry. And a lot of these ideas, they, they're sort of born out of Giotto landscapes that I was looking at too during the year. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of some, something that's come from there. Mm. I was going to jump in and ask you about the framing that you're doing too, because I think mm. just before we move or deviate rather from the Brexit on the horizon, these very unusual times, what's evolved in the, for the works in the exhibition and actually all of the works on canvas include this idea of the painted frame, of the frame within the border of the Yes, yeah, I, I mean, what, what I find really fascinating about that is that 
the the frame business has, has basically come from the fencing around the garden wall, you know, the garden that, that housed everything in there, contained it. And, and as this work's gone on during the year, and I've gone to back to making big canvases, it's like a shorthand of, of that garden fence, but now it's just become this very simple frame. And it was interesting because I, I heard somebody say on this little uh, podcast how human beings are always uh, trying to find new boundaries. Uh, it's a kind of in the nature of the human psyche to try and find new boundaries. And when they found these boundaries that they, they you know, a couple of days later, they will see them very much as a prison. And the, the guy speaking about this was saying, well, actually, both are completely necessary. You need both that inside and outside. And so I just immediately decided, right, that's a really good idea. I'm going to see how it works for me. So began each piece by painting a border around it. And then I'd start to make paintings in there. And I found, funnily enough and strangely enough, that it actually gave me more of a sense of freedom to work within that in pretty much the same way as working in the garden on the garden drawings where you know it's in a book it's in a frame and um i've got this freedom to to do whatever i can and discover what what i can en route as it were so i mm -hmm. have this image up because this might be a nice moment to ask you about how the works on paper have started to inform the kind of sculptural elements that you're exploring in the canvases? Well, uh, it's, it's interesting because this whole last year has been one of uh, a, a, a synthesis of such because a lot of the paperwork that I'd been making in the studio where I would uh, cut and fold and hang and rearrange have found their way into the canvases and there seems to me quite a sort of marked, markedly uh obvious step or yeah. a more apparent sort of link between that and the new work um i know I that for some it might be pretty difficult for them to sort of make that with a leap of faith but actually i i can see it quite well i'm i have struggled with it that i have these sort of two um areas of of interest that don't seem to have be so apparent or don't look like they married well together or belong to each other but actually I'm beginning more and more as the year has gone on to see that actually they do it's uh one is informing the other the folded pig pieces pieces on paper um of the sort of echoes in the paintings as well and the big paintings for example the the big blue square piece and the yellow one um they look like folded and unfolded works that have at one time been folded up and then been flattened out again so there is that Still, those looks that they that the folded works on paper have and i think what's particularly successful in exploring that is to have the works on canvas at this size too because then yes. you're really able those sort of pockets of intensity that the works on paper have in their folds mm. and in their smaller scale. But interestingly, I, I, I've had this sort of idea about the world inside the painted frame for quite some time and the world outside of it. For example, if you, everything that is painted within the sort of rectilinear canvas is a fixed space, it's a fixed time. You can take it, put it anywhere, and whatever is inside it remains the same. Whereas if you have like an installation idea with papers and other objects, they're, they're so temporary and so um, malleable that, that, they, that each time you, you put them up, you can reconfigure them. So there's a sort of constant changing energy about them that isn't sort of fixed like it is inside the inside the painted frame um but having said that of course um i've gone completely with the idea of the frame because it's presented so much more fascinating possibilities for me but having said that it's informed by 
the uh, the previous work that I've made. Yeah, you're creating yourself a blank piece of paper by the frame. It's interesting that some mm. others might find it limiting, but you're finding it completely the opposite. Yes, absolutely. And the also the other thing about that is is this. We're always outside of the frame looking in, we're peering into it, whereas many things in one room, the room becomes the frame and you're very much part of it. It's like you are included within that and you are, um, you, you can walk around it and be mm. Mm. an addition to it really, I suppose. Exactly. And in terms of the hang, it was great fun to put the exhibition together for you um, and to work with you doing it. We wanted to achieve a bit of a sense of what happens in the studio. Why, again, looking at this image that we wanted to sort of have a direct relationship with the works on paper and the casual way that you move them around, turn them on their head sometimes, overlay them. That too feels to me very much what you're explaining about how the canvases are built up. Um, yes. That happens quite physically in the studio with you. Mm. It does, it does, yes. Um, I, I'm still kind of fascinated by the way in which things are put together and drawn together. Um, for example, I, one of the questions that, that does uh, steer me and, and keep me uh, interested in making work is, is this, how is it that we know when something works and when it doesn't? Um, what is it about it that, that we know when something works and we know when it doesn't? So that's a kind of fascinating thing about construction, about composition, about putting things together that's always been at the root of what I'm trying to get at really. Yeah, yeah. That, um, and maybe that's where the artistry comes in, knowing exactly where what the final line is, or if something needs a bit more. It, but the, the, come back to the question of how, how is it that we know this, you see, that's, that's the most intriguing and mysterious thing about it. And that's what I think is at the root of, of um, creativity and art is, how is it that you know? What is it that you see that makes something good and something not so good? I mean, we all have an opinion on that, don't we? Because we have different tastes, but when we, do, <laughs> when we do agree, it seems like, oh, that's right. That's exactly how it should be. Exactly. <laughs> hmm. um, and then newness of the work, we think has been made really at the end of last year, very beginning of this year. So it's all very much kind of as, as recent as it gets in that sense. And it feels like this scale, the scale of the larger canvas is something you're pursuing and something you're particularly excited about at the moment. It is, yes. Um, I think that uh, I had these, these stretches in my studio that I haven't really used since about 2006. And there they were sort of like propped up against the wall and I thought, I really need to have a go at doing this and seeing what comes out, seeing what comes up with, with stretching a couple of canvases, you know. And then suddenly I've got four of them, and then there's a fifth, and then I've got two smaller ones that are slightly smaller. So I have <laughs> all these big works, whereas I was pretty much involved in very small works up until that time, really. But one doesn't counteract the other in a nice way in your work. You're still very much working on the idea of exploring the works on paper and actually there's something hopefully later in the year in France, am I right in saying, that will be works on paper? Uh, well, in that was actually, I, I've put that off that because of COVID and probably because of Brexit as well, but I was invited to take part in the Festival for Art in Chapels in Brittany, which is an event that is um, happens every year 
I think it's something like 15 chapels in a small valley in Brittany. Uh, and each artist is invited to come along and make site specific work for the actual venue. And they're very much still working, operating chapels. So they used for prayer and, and religious gatherings, stuff like that. And, uh, but since the, the COVID and really the Brexit thing, I've, I've postponed it for another year, which they've been very understanding about and accepted and they get it, you know. Yeah. But I was really looking forward to that. And I thought that if I did do that, or when I do that, the work would probably be completely different again, probably go back to something that I'd made before, or the kind of work that I'd made before with like large coloured paper folded pieces, something that's appropriate to the setting. Be lovely. It'll work so well. I look forward to seeing what you'll what you'll come up with. And um, we did throw out a few questions to your followers on Instagram. Would now be a good moment to refer to a few questions? Yes, please do. So we had a few really nice things. And um, what what makes me think of it is talking about these larger canvases as you were prior to what you last said. There was a comment about them reminding this person of mazes and labyrinths. Yes. And when we had just talked about that question coming through, you said that wasn't the first time somebody had No, there was a, a, a comment made by an artist friend in, in Yorkshire who said that they were like many landscapes, one on top of the other. And they were also like forgotten things, um, which I thought was quite, quite a very sensitive observation really to make. Um, to me, some of those large new pieces, they're very much about the eye not being able to settle so easily on one particular area. Um, it's, it's also like a, a mind map also when you look at them, you just think these remind me a bit of some of those Philip Guston heads that he painted where they, they like this kind of monstrousness about them. And um, that was something that I started to become aware of as I, I was, as I was making them, thinking this is, this is quite, quite extraordinary, really. Sure. I always note that your references are always so contemporary and historical all at once. I mean, it feels like the artists you're looking at daily in the studio and your repertoire is so informed by such a breadth of people. Is that the case? It is really. I, I mean, I, I have sort of interest from people like from Robert Mangold to Cy Twombly, Agnes Martin, like Frau Angelico, Giotto. Titian, uh, Brancusi. In fact, the Brancusi has come into it quite a lot, really, since I saw his... I made a couple... When I was in Paris a, a couple of years ago, I went back and made a... Um, went to see the, the Brancusi Museum on a couple of occasions, and I was completely bowled over by it, the way in which all of that busyness in, in that museum of his work is... is it sort of, inf all the work seems to inform each other and yet each piece itself is really quite autonomous. Mm. And um, the arrangements and the way in which these shapes and forms inform each other um, are quite, was quite extraordinary. Um, but actually saying that it's, what I found me and my, my wife went to Kettle's Yard end of last year when we were allowed to travel uh, to see, um, what was it, Alfred Wallace exhibition up there. And um, we went to the main house and I think there were two Brancusis, definitely one Brancusi, and it's a head laying on top of a piano. And my feeling was, oh my God, it's like away from the flock. It's, it's, it's here and it's really sad. It needs to be back there in the museum amongst its friends. And I think seeing that and that sort of thought and idea about seeing it has come into this as well. This, this work as, as being this hubbub and hustle and bustle of all these forms uh, with an energy moving around in these canvases are, um, uh, are really what 
sort of stimulated this work, I think. Yeah, and to me it feels very much what your, your play, I suppose, for want of a better word, in the studio with the works on paper is. Because there things are always informed by their pairings or their groupings or, I mean, there are a few shots in this reel here of, mm. we've shown yes. works pulled out of this. It's not like they rely on the cluster, but that no. is the environment that you're definitely making this work in. Yes, it's, it's also the other question comes into it about autonomy as well, you know, are these things as, as individuals strong enough to stand up on their own or are they part of a bigger, um, a bigger swarm, if you like, for their strength? And I think that's quite a nice philosophical question to, to ask, um, really. I don't think there's an answer to it, but I, I like having that question in my mind of, are these mutually reliant? Are we mutually reliant? Is and, and interdependent? Are things really truly independent? Yeah, I think that's particularly nice. One of the questions we got from one of your admirers on Instagram was, what questions drive your work? And actually, I think you've answered that in a nice way, that you, you're posing questions to yourself all the time. Yes, yeah, true, and, and I don't necessarily know if I get any answers, but I'm sort of pretty absorbed in the questions as they arise. And you know, what is it that makes a good painting? What what is it? What is it that makes a painting work? What do I need to do to bring in the many ideas that I have, and for them to be carried out in a in a piece of work? Hmm. Um, well, I think doing it particularly well and when there are bodies of work like like what we're showing together now that you can choose a moment to address one side of things and then the next to address the next and I mean this show is certainly very different from the last presentation we had together which still had works from the night garden series um mm. but the palette was different your exploration of themes were completely different um so I think you're doing that brilliantly Thank you. Well, actually, it's interesting because I, I actually don't see there's a difference to me. To me, I, I look at these things and go, it just as they're flashing up on the screen now, I, I think to myself, there are so many echoes and um, uh, references that, that sort of cross over each other that it's... One of the it's reasons something I... that go on sorry no i was going to say it's it, it's um no it's gone i'm sorry you're talking about <sighs> crossing over references sorry um i think that's it really i don't need to add any more to that that was a sort of end of statement in itself <laughs> one of the reasons i introduced or rather included this painting in the um slideshow here is because we had a real we were both roaring with laughter when you'd called this the lion tamer yeah because of course we saw we see the lion i mean this yeah. is a painting that has evolved from one of the moleskin sketches you can make out the trellis of the garden you can just about see yeah. the parameter um mm. you can definitely see the lion and the lion tamer when you know what to look for but this was before the moleskin mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, it was. When you'd come out of lockdown, laden with these beautiful books of drawings of where the animals had quite literally come to life in the garden, it was a, it was interesting to see it hadn't actually start it had started for, even before that. Yes, that's true. It, it really has, and it's like this painter's painting has informed other drawings since. So that's very interesting. And one of the things that you and I have both noticed in a lot of the work that I've been making is. There are birds everywhere. That's why like I think this one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah, I mean, this one is like these starlings on the roof at the back of our house, on a house at the back of ours, in the chimney pots, and mischievous, noisy starlings. And I never set out to make this painting of specifically about that, but once I'd made it, I realized exactly where that had come from. So. Mm. that's pretty much how I work as well actually I um 
I like to think that I make them up as I go along. And, and the process of making up allows other ideas to come to fruition. Yeah. And it's a, it's a real roundabout way of doing it, I suppose, but I, I don't really work in, in any other way than that. It's, it is a question of, okay, I've got this support, this canvas or paper, I'll, I will begin. Mm. and see what materialises, see what comes up. Well, it's been really lovely to talk. So thank you so much for making time to do so. You're I'm, welcome. Thank you. There will be about 10 days of the exhibition being open to the public in April, when I'm Ooh. allowed to reopen the 12th. I've already started taking bookings for people to come. Ooh. So if anybody would like to come, they must just let me know.